Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first off, I would like to acknowledge that CAL represents member, CAL CBUA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries are the homeland of the Inuit of Nunatsiavit and Nunatchikavit, the Innu of Nitasanin, the Bayothic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. In Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. In New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wallastokiak, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. We at CAL CBUA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the First Peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. So good afternoon. My name is Allison Farrell, and I'm the Research Data Management and Public Services Librarian at the Health Sciences Library at Memorial University of Newfoundland. On behalf of CAL CBUA, the Digital Preservation Stewardship Committee, and our partners ACENET and the Digital Alliance of Canada RDM team, formerly Andrio Portage, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 CAL CBUA Research Data Management Series. The francisation, I don't know how to say that. The francisation of the event is made possible through the collaboration of the members of the Research Data Management Working Group of the Bureau de la Coopération Interuniversitaire, BCI. Special thanks to our organizers, Margaret Vale, Cynthia Lise, Cynthia Holt, Aaron McPherson, Louise Gill. Victoria Volkanova. This session is being recorded and will be available after the presentation on the CAL CBUA website. We ask that all attendees mute their microphones and turn off their webcams during the presentation. This is just so the bandwidth will be um, easier for everyone to, to view the presentation. You can access the controls for your camera and microphone either at the bottom or the top of your screen. And if you have technical problems, please put them in the chat box during the main presentation. Please remember to be kind, courteous, and respectful of the presenters and other attendees. If you have any questions during the session, you can put them into the chat box. So now I'd like to introduce Louise Gillis and Aaron McPherson, who will be speaking on data management plans and using the DMP tool, their assistant. Louise Gillis is the research data management librarian and interim liaison librarian for the College of Pharmacy and the School of Health Administration at Dalhousie University. Erin McPherson is the Research and Instruction Librarian based in, Toronto, in Truro at the Dalhousie University Agricultural Campus. Okay, take it away, Erin and Louise. Thanks so much. Thanks, Allison, for the introduction. So, um, today's topic, data management planning and specifically a look at the DMP system. We've got a couple of goals in mind for today's session. We'll be covering um, data management plans themselves, talking about how useful they can be. We we'll then like you to walk away with confidence to build your own data management plan using the free online DMP assistant tool. And finally, we want to make sure that you're well aware of the resources such as the exemplar DMPs and the sensitive data toolkit that can help you as you go about building your plan. So first, let's back up just that tiny bit and talk about what research data management is. Research data management is the management of research data throughout the research life cycle. It's the practice of structuring, organizing, maintaining and caring for research data. It's things like documenting your process, uh, being consistent in the way that you name your files, taking care to ensure you back up your work. It's measures such as these that will ensure work has long term value, enable verification of results and open up the possibility of doing new innovative research. Plus, and this is an important plus, RDM practices like writing DMPs are going to keep you in compliance with funder, funder, publisher, and institutional requirements. So also, I think it's important to just define what we mean by research data. Um, research data isn't strictly what's coming out of a microscope. It is defined really as primary sources used to support technical or scientific inquiry. Um, it is 
anything really has the capacity to become research data, but it could be experimental data, observational data, operational data, third party data, public sector data, monitoring data, processed or repurposed. Um, to talk about research data management, I'll just hand these things over to Aaron. OK, I just took control of the screen, Louise, so hopefully <laughs> hopefully this is showing up. Um, so yeah, who's responsible for research data management? Well, we all have a responsibility. I'm pretty sure that's a quote from somewhere. Um, but research uh, data management responsibilities are shared amongst the different stakeholders. So researchers, administrators, uh, service and infrastructure providers, uh, policymakers, librarians and data stewards. Um, so it's not just the researcher. There's lots of us who have uh, responsibilities for research data management. And we have this great little video, um, how to avoid a data management nightmare. And I am going to, uh, this video touches on some of the benefits of research data management. It also kind of shows uh, some horror stories that can happen too. So let's get this video up. And hopefully you can hear the sound. Can everyone hear the sound? Yes. Okay, great.
So um, I don't know how many of you have seen that video before, but it's, uh, it's done by NYU Health Sciences Library, and I love showing it. Um, we show it regularly to graduate students, and um, it's it's just a great video uh, that shows the importance of planning and potential things that you might run into. And I don't know about any of you, but I have experienced a number of those things, um, including some of the disasters uh, just working in a library. Floods sometimes happen. We've had a fire on our campus. There's been, you know, and those those are the big things. Um, but there's many other things that uh, that can happen, and uh, and that planning can can really help you with. So, how can we be prepared? Um, create a da data management plan. And we've got a definition here from CASRAE. Um, they describe a data management plan or a DMP as a formal statement describing how research data will be managed and documented throughout a research project and the terms regarding the subsequent deposit of the data with a data repository for long term management and presentation. So a data management plan um, is built around the particular needs of this pro of your project, so not all questions may be applicable to your project, but the general uh, concepts are similar. So how are you backing up your information? Um, are there any ethical considerations? There may not be, but uh, or well, may not be uh, that may vary across projects. Um, so each data management plan will be built around the particular needs um, and requirements associated with that project. Um, a data management plan is a living document, so I like to say it's like a strategic plan. Hopefully it's not just going to sit on the shelf. It's something that you'll refer to and can help guide you. Um, it should be understood by everyone and if you have team members, so if you're running, if you have a lab and you have graduate students and, and lab assistants, um, or if there's you know research collaborators, it should be understood by everyone and uh, and, and you should be on the same page. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So why create a formal plan? Aside from uh, the benefits that we just saw and hopefully uh, mitigating some potential disasters, um, we might also be required to have a formal data management plan by our funders. And we have a link to the Tri-Agency Research Data Management Policy. Um, and in addition, uh, some journals may have data sharing or data availability requirements. And that's something that can be addressed at the planning stage. So in the beginning of your project, you're obviously you're not ready to deposit your data, but thinking about it early on is really important. Um, things like informed consent uh, and so on. These are all considerations you have to do. And so I just have a link to one of the uh, journal's research data policies. Um, next slide is uh, just a link to the Tri-Agency Research Data Management Policy. I say section three is the really uh, the important one that has the requirements. Um, so 3.2 is data management plans. Um, and then by spring of 2022, the agencies will identify the initial set of funding opportunities subject to the DMP requirement. And there's going to be a pilot um, for targeted funding opportunities before that date. So um, hopefully that will be starting soon. But the great thing is, we're going to get to that, is that uh, we have a lot of things that can help you with it. So what goes in your data management plan? Uh, as we said, um, they're all all data management plans uh, may be different, but the the concepts are the components are similar. So generally, you're going to have um, a section for data collection, documentation and metadata, storage and backup, preservation, sharing and reuse of the data, responsibilities and resources. So whose responsibility is it for data management? Um, do different people have different responsibilities in your lab? Um, and then finally, ethics and legal compliance. As we said, um, starting early is key. Uh, it may seem like a lot of work in the beginning, but really uh, thinking about these questions at the beginning stages of your project is just only going to help you. Uh, planning is ongoing because, as we know, change is constant um, and, and it happens. So uh, having this document you can refer to is very helpful. 
And finally, the great thing is that uh, we have an online free bilingual tool that can help you with data management planning, and it's called the DMP Assistant. And I'm going to turn that over to Louise. Great, thank you, Erin. So yes, with that introduction, let's talk about the, the tool uh, we came to discuss, and that is the DMP Assistant. So the DMP Assistant is a tool um, that helps people in their preparation of data management plans. It is hosted by the University of Alberta, and what it does is, and it's supported by the, um, the Alliance, and what it does is it helps researchers better manage their data throughout the lifespan of a project. So it prompts researchers to answer a number of key data management questions and supports each of those questions, those prompts, with best practice guidance and examples. So for those of you who might be familiar with the DMP assistant and um, just want us to skip ahead to, to looking at its um, at its features. I wanted to just take a second to remind you that in the spring of this past year, DMP Assistant 2.0 was launched and with it a number of new features. So um, those features are the ability to clone DMPs for use in similar projects, um, the enhanced bilingualism and the ability for institutions to create more flexible DMP templates. So if you're working within the DMP assistant and you um, find that the template isn't reflective of your needs, then speak to your institutional representative and you can talk about how you can um, customize that template to better suit your needs and, and those of your colleagues. OK, so the DMP assistant, if you were to navigate there now, and I saw that Aaron provided a link in the chat, it looks like this. The reason that I'm showing you the home page is that it is embedded with heaps of really useful resources. So under the getting started um, list, you'll find links through to many of the resources that we'll mention later on in the presentation. But there's brief guides, there are exemplars and webinars listed, and all of those are really, really useful tools if you find yourself getting stuck or just having questions about how best to fill out the, uh, the required information. So, uh, right, I just wanted to highlight those resources and then point to how you can create an account. Creating, a, creating an account is really simple. You just need to provide your email um, and set up a password and you're good to go. Once you log in, you'll be taken to your dashboard. Um, I've created an account, so associated with my account are the projects that I've already created. Um, so I can see the projects that I've created. I can see the templates that I use to create those projects. The last time that I edited the documents, what role I have in the project. So in uh, the screen in front of us, we can see that I'm the, the owner on both of these projects. We can see whether these are private or available to the public and whether or not they've been shared. There's also an actions drop down menu and from there I could edit my existing plan, I could share it, I could export it or I could even choose to delete it. So from I'll go back just one screen to show you that there's um, at the top of the of, of the screen there is an create plans link and if I click that then I can start working on my project. So I get a series of prompts. I'm asked to name a project and identify what research organization I'm affiliated with. So there is a drop down menu and I can select my institution. Dalhousie is listed. If it isn't, that's not a problem. It's not going to prevent you from using the um, the the assistant, um, you could just select the, the box, no research organization associated with this plan or my research organization is not listed. Once that's complete, I can choose a specific template. 
So by default, you'll be prompt. Uh, you'll be using the Portage default template, but there are a number of specifics, um, often to institutions, but also based on research type. So I could choose a systematic review template if that was appropriate. And in this example, I've chosen the Dalhousie University generic plan. And I've done that because my work is associated with Dalhousie and I want that specific institutional advice. So once that sort of administrative detail is entered, I can enter my project title and begin um, completing the form. So I can enter my funder information if that's appropriate, my grant number and a project abstract. An important note here is that all of these fields are prompts for you. You don't have to include any information. It's what is useful to you and your project. The other important thing to note is that you can skip through. You don't have to fill things out sequentially. If it makes more sense for you to fill out sections that are further along in the process, you can do that and you can revisit um, as, as you like. OK. Next slide. Um, in an earlier slide, Erin talked a little bit about the prompts or the areas of um, questions, the, the, the focuses that tend to be present in a DMP. And I'll just repeat those here. They're the ones that show up in the DMP assistant. So when you're filling it out, you're going to be asked or questions about data collection, documentation and metadata, storage and backup, preservation, sharing and reuse, responsibility and resources, and finally, ethics and legal compliance. So again, just really want to stress that you only need to answer those questions that are relevant to your project, um, and that for each of these categories, there is guidance provided, and very often institutions will provide some additional guidance that's specific to your institution. So once you've done all of the project details, you begin can begin filling in the plan. Every question that you're asked and is accompanied by guidance and prompts. So you when you're asked what types of data will you collect, create, link to, acquire and or record, if that doesn't immediately prompt an answer from you, you can toggle over and look at the guidance provided. So um, that can often just be that prompt you need to, to start thinking about what that question is really asking. You also have the option here of toggling over to leave comments for anybody that you're working on the project with. So this can be a really collaborative process as you go ahead and, and fill out the DMP. OK, once the plan is complete, you have lots of options on exporting your data. So you have the option, well, sorry, even before you're exporting it, you have the option of setting its visibility. So by default, you're working on it privately, but you can choose to share it with your institution or more broadly um, with the public. You can also choose here to manage collaborations, so you could invite people to work on the project with you to, to contribute to the DMP. Um, and in the next slide, um, you can see that there's options for exporting, so download settings. You can export this as a PDF if you like, but you could also choose to export it on a Word document and fancy it up in Word if that was your preference. So I'm just going to uh, take back the slides. I'm going to just go back two slides a bit because there's a question in the chat. Um, Jennifer, I think we can answer this now. Um, working with trainees, who should be the owner, the trainee or the PI, or is there co-ownership? So there's actually co-ownership. You can have someone as a co-owner, owner, or you can have them as an editor. Um, and then there's a third level, and I think it's read only. 
I can't quite see now, um, but uh, yeah, there's different levels uh, that you can have, but uh, certainly a co-owner or even an editor um, is something that you could uh, you could look at. Read only. It's what I thought. <laughs> I wondered if it changed. <laughs> yeah, read only. Um, and the nice thing too that I uh, meant to point out is when you answer the questions, you can see who answered the questions, which is always kind of, you know, might may or may not be helpful also. Um, and just uh, can help keep you on track. So OK, so hopefully that answered your question on um, whether or not who should be the owner. Um, I think my my personal opinion is it would be nice if the PI was at least the co-owner. Um, Louise, do you have thoughts on that? Or, or um, personal preference, I, I, I'd say the same thing. I think that that tends to be the person that sees the project through and that anyone else is coming and going. So you want to really have some consistency there, somebody that is going yes to see the project through. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I think that's one of the questions on the DMP too. Uh, chain personnel changes in the lab and ultimate responsibilities. Like who will be responsible for updating the plan? That could be a, um, you know, a data manager or it could be another person in your lab or in your research team. Um, but as the PI, I, I would think anyways, that would be good to have to be the co-owners to just oversee everything that's happening. Um, but yeah. Uh, so some other resources that we wanted to highlight to you and we have some links, but you'll uh, you'll I think we'll put them drop them in the chat. I think they're already there. Um, you have the link to the DMP assistant, um, but Portage Network has some really great training resources. Uh, so the DMP exemplars, they're the sample data management plans. Um, I think there's nine of them in a variety of subject areas. So humanities, social sciences, mixed methods. Um, these can be a great place to look, you know, because we get the question, what does the data management plan look like? The exemplars are a great place to have a look. Um, they were developed by experts across the country um, and they're freely available for you to use and, and have a look at and give good guidance. Um, also on the Portage website, there's some brief guides and by brief, I mean, I think one to two pages, so they, they truly are brief. Um, on how to create an effective data management plan. There's also modules, so little um, training teaching sessions that will uh, kind of walk you through some of these uh, some of these things to consider. And there's a sensitive data toolkit and data management guidance for COVID-19, and I'm going to go into those a bit more in the next slides. OK, so um, here is the oh, sorry. Here is the exemplar plans or the link to them um, right now. They're oh, and they're bilingual as well. So we have them in natural sciences, social sciences, digital humanities, secondary data. So definitely have a look. They're a great resource um, all there for you. Um, the next slide. Uh, Oh, so these are things to consider when you're looking at the plans. They will have some additional guidance in there also, which is fantastic. Um, so not only is it an example, it just gives you these little hints also. And here's some more. What are anticipated storage requirements for your project in terms of storage space? Um, and the length of time you'll be storing it. So instead of thinking these questions up, they're all provided for you. And um, and again, you have sample answers, but then guidance just to, to give you that extra bit of help as well. OK, so the next thing is uh, the sensitive data resources. So uh, questions we get all the time is, well, I'm working with sensitive data or my uh, my data has some ethical considerations. Uh, well, Portage has a sensitive data toolkit for research researchers and uh, the link is in the chat and in that is um, a glossary of terms for sensitive data for research purposes. There's a also a human participant research data risk matrix, which is really helpful. And finally, uh, RDM language for informed consent. So those are things like, well, um, you, you have this data, you collect it, but maybe you want to use it for a different purpose. Informed consent is getting all that right up front before the project starts. So um, having this tool uh, and these resources available are a great help. There's also some COVID-19 related resources. Um, there's a guide uh, for COVID-19 rapid response data sharing and deposit for uh, Canadian researchers. So um, 
some recommended repositories if you're going to be depositing COVID-19 related research data. Questions like, can I even share my data? So this will give you some guidance on that. Guidance for de-identification um, and documentation and supporting material required for deposit. So um, it's not just the data that needs to be deposited, but how is that data, how can it be used? Um, are there any uh, restrictions that go along with that data? How can somebody else understand that data? So these are things that can, uh, that can go along with that. And we have links to that uh, package in the chat as well. And I think this is my slide. Oh, this is Louise's slide. I will pass back to you, Louise. <laughs> Yes, well, we kind of um, did a whirlwind tour, I think, a little quicker than we anticipated. But yes, if you're looking to learn more, then there are a couple of places where you can turn. First, the Portage Network itself. Um, at the following link, you'll find many of the resources that Aaron talked us through. So the exemplars, which are fantastic and a really good starting place if you're finding yourself um, with lots of questions as you as you look through the DMP assistant, um, but also the sensitive data and the COVID specific resources. You can also get in touch. So Allison's just shared this in the chat. Thank you, Allison. Find your institutional RDM contact. Every university across the country has a representative that is in that role to answer questions in part in that role to answer questions about RDM. So find out who your contact is and get in touch with them about specific questions. If you're looking to find out more about the tri-agency RDM requirements, then follow the link provided here um, and you'll find out all of the latest and maybe even let us know about when these uh, these trials are meant to happen with the RDM uh, or sorry, the DMP uh, requirement. Given that we're done just that little bit early, the formal presentation, I think what I might do is just share my screen and show you the DMP assistant live, but we can also take questions if, if people have them now. Okay, there are no questions in the chat right now, but does anyone have uh, any questions for Louise or Aaron at the moment? I have a comment, it's Erin. <laughs> um, it's just more of a point to highlight. Uh, so the Portage Assistant, when you um, log in and look and create an account and go to create a DMP, and Louise can probably show this, um, your institution may or may not be listed there. So uh, some institutions have uh, created um, their own custom guidance. So at Dell, we've created a, a generic template. It's based off the Portage generic template, but we have some custom DAL guidance. So when it comes to um, ethical considerations, we'll have a link to our REB at Dalhousie um, and things like that. So just because you don't see your institution there doesn't mean that that's totally fine. You can use the Portage template, um, but there might be other templates that are more suitable. Like I know we've done some custom ones for some of the national research groups. Uh, that are that are around. So I'll let Louise, Louise you go ahead. <laughs> okay, can you sh see my screen? Yep. Yes. Yep. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. So exactly as Aaron has said, if you don't see your institution listed here, that isn't a problem. You're just going to have um, a smaller list of institute or of DNP templates to choose from, but they're really good templates, so it's not a worry at all. And again, you can always contact your institutional representative and talk about your specific needs um, if you don't think that the templates that are available to you are suiting your needs. So, um, in the in the in the example that we showed earlier, we looked at Dalhousie University. When that's selected, you have this drop down menu of available options. So the generic or the um, pan Canadian available portage resources, but then the specific one. So Dalhousie University generic plan. If I had instead selected that there was no in uh, research organization affiliation, then that drop down list would just be those portage resources. 
if I do choose the portage template and choose to create a plan, then um, I'm given the lovely descriptive name Louise's plan, which I would likely change to something more descriptive of the project that I was working on. Um, and then as explained earlier, uh, talked about earlier, the visibility is by default private, but I can change that to public if I feel like sharing, um, or I could um, limit the visibility to my organization specifically. I could also indicate that the project that I was working on was a test and that it was really just getting myself familiar with the platform. We do have a couple of questions here now, Louise, if you wanted to address those. Great, so um, I will jump back to this. Um, so the first one is for IWK REB research. So that's the IWK is the Children's Hospital in Halifax uh, and REB would be Research Ethics Board. So for the IWK REB research, would the DAL template be the best one to follow? I've partially, uh, I've partially answered that also, Louise. So, but uh, please add, please chime in on that. <laughs> oh, I'm just reading through your answer, uh, Aaron. That's a good question. Dun, da, da, da. Yes. Um, no, that's a. I, I don't have anything to add. I think that's a great answer. There isn't anything specifically built for the IWK. And really, the big point of difference between the Portage generic template and the one that um, is built for Dalhousie is just that we've got institutional specific prompts. So, talking about the research ethic board here at the university. Um, in either instance, it's not going to be specific to the IWK, um, but you would be able to probably extrapolate and just um, take out what was relevant for you. And again, as Aaron said, if that's something that you're interested in doing, then, then talk to us and we can see what we can do. Great, thanks Louise. Um, another nice. question, if your institution isn't listed in the DMP assistant, once you register, will it come up for new users from your organization? And Aaron has answered that one as well in the chat. It will only be visible if your institution creates its own custom template. So yes, as if your institution does take that step to create the custom template, then your institution will appear in the list. Otherwise, no. And I think I, I may have misunderstood it also um, because when you log in and create an account, there's an option to sign in through single sign in. But instead of creating a unique username and password, um, and if that's what you meant, then your institution has to set that up through the, um, it's called Canadian, and I don't remember what it's called, but I know Dalhousie doesn't have it yet because I IT is still working on it. I think it's um, Canadian Access Federation or something yes, like that. I think that's it, yeah. Um, yes. Okay, and we have another question. Thank you very much. Um, so this is from Aaron, uh, a di different Aaron, I think. I'm an yes. RDM contact at a university. Are there benefits to creating a custom template versus just using the de default? Um, so yeah, Aaron, feel free to jump in on this one too. Um, I think the benefits, yes, there's benefits. Um, and it is just because there are those prompts that can be specific to your organization. And, and the one that jumps to mind is um, when you're talking about the research ethic board. And um, every institution is going to have um, different requirements of their researchers. And it's just if the more specific you can be, I think the, the better the advice hits. Erin, did you want to add something? Yeah, um, especially like I know. I'm still getting I've been at Dell for since 2012 and I'm still getting used to where everything is because <laughs> I'm on the Truro campus and not the Halifax campus. So um, I find it's helpful to have some of those things like even storage like so your your institution may say only sensitive data can be stored on this drive or in this location and this type of data gets stored here and contact these people having that in the guidance in the template 
is really helpful. Otherwise, uh, you'll have the generic guidance, and I think it points to UBC. I could be wrong on that, if I recall. Um, but yeah, th that that's just a nice helpful thing. Um, and there is uh, on the Portage website, I think that's where the, the guidance is for um, RDM contacts to create uh, that custom that custom guidance. Yeah, and I'm just I'm look sorry. Um, while Aaron spoke, I just uh, had a uh, had a look at one of our our template at Dalhousie, and there are instances when we point to ITS, and then there's also points where we let the, people know that if they've got questions or if they want to know more about that specific question, they can contact the RDM team, and there's a a direct link to our um, our email address. So just having those resource or institution specific resources is definitely an asset. Go for it. Yeah, um, here our REB has this great two pager handout that I never ever let out of my sight. Like it's it's just answers half the questions we get, <laughs> if not more. Um, and just linking that in the the, the guidance is, is really helpful having it on hand, so. Excellent, thanks guys. Um, any other questions for Aaron or Louise? You can type them into the chat. Um, there are, so we'll just wait a minute or two. I oh, found yeah. the same thing with, with our template. Um, I was able to put in a contact to our metadata librarian in the metadata and documentation section. And then, and like you guys said, um, Put in links to IT services and things like that in the customized templates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was pointed out is that some of the questions may be similar to an ethics application, and depending on your institution, that you know it may be uh, very similar. It may not be similar at all. Um, but again, you know these are things. It, I am a planner and it just <laughs> I really can't emphasize how helpful it is to plan up front and uh, and think about some of these uh, things, especially personally, I, I always refer to to change. Change happens so much, especially, you know, you have people graduating, coming and going from your team. You're probably you could be working with people across the country, people in a, or in a different country um, and considering how uh, you know, who accesses the data, how long will they have access, um, who's responsible for doing certain things. It, it really is great to think about this up front and, uh, and you know, and then if there's changes, it, personally, it, from what I've heard, it makes it a little bit easier <laughs> if changes actually happen when they happen. But yes, the DMP and Portage uh, resources, I we can't promote them enough. They're excellent resources um, and there's lots of people available to help if you have questions. And uh, I've put our email in the chat for any folks at Dell who'd like to get in touch or even, you know, will get in touch with us uh, and uh, hopefully we can help. And for anyone at other institutions, I think if you contact your library, whether it's them that does uh, data management stuff or if somebody else on campus, they'll be able to put you in touch with the right people. Okay, so I don't see any further questions in the chat. Uh, so thank you very much, Louise and Aaron. That was a really great presentation and a really good introduction to those tools. And, and like you, Aaron, I can't promote those uh, Portage tools enough. Oh yeah, I should turn on my camera. Um, I can't promote those tools enough. Um, they're fantastic. It would just take way too much work if all of us had to recreate those same sort of tools and guidance. You know. <laughs> um, so thank you again for uh, for pointing those out. Um, I want to invite everyone to um, register for the rest of the uh, sessions in this webinar series. The link is in the chat. There are, will be a session. Um, the next session I believe that's going ahead is the how to use Dataverse and other uh, data repositories session. So that'll be a really great one. Um, and if you're interested in research data management and things like this, check out the Portage website. Uh, it will be changing its name eventually, um, but check out that website because there's lots of different webinars on so many different aspects of research data management and they're most of them are linked to from there. Uh, so thanks very much, Louise and Aaron. Um, and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Allison, and thanks all. Thank you all.